There comes a moment in every person's life where we have to expose ourselves as the filthy degenerates we are deep inside. For me, that moment is now, because I can no longer keep myself from shouting at the top of my lungs just how much I love Sizeru. How much do you love Sizeru? I love Sizeru so fucking much! Back when I was obscenely young and infinitely curious, I fell down the rabbit hole that is yaoi. BL. Men loving men. Sausage fest. You get the idea. As I obsessively read through pages and pages of incredibly questionable and definitely inappropriate content, one day I stumbled across Doshite mo Furetakunai by Yoneda Ko. The art style was right up my alley, so after crying my eyes out for a quick second, I went to look for the author's other works. And I found Saizuru, the one yaoi that ruined almost every other yaoi for me. It was the Wagyu steak of BL manga. After having this wonderfully juicy and tender steak that is Saizuru, no other steak tasted the same. My palate had reached nirvana, and all my ailments were cured. As a respectable member of society, I read Saizuru locked in my room and never spoke a peep of it except to my poor partner, who had to come to terms with the fact that I regularly fawned over other men and worried about their well-being. But then, an announcement came in 2019. There would be a movie made after Saizuru, which would cover chapters 1 through 8 in the manga, and it would eventually have an English release. And the beast inside me just exploded with love and excitement. What studio decided to brave the world of BL? One you probably haven't heard of before. Grizzly. And there's a reason you probably haven't seen anything else by them, which is because this was their first feature film. What a way to make an entrance. As if the OVA they put out a year before wasn't flashy enough. Other people have reviewed this movie from an outsider's perspective, but this one is for the fans. This rant is for all the fans who have been internally screaming ever since we got the first movie announcement and preview. Gather round and let's begin. Cue a nice crowded city street in the Nihon, with people beating each other up in a dark alley under the oddly seductive gaze of Yashiro, our favorite Wakagashira. Walking into this frame is the disgruntled Dr. Kageyama. And for anyone who's a fan, a small tear appears in our eyes as we know this is the beginning of yet another heartbreak for Yashiro. With a quick glance at the enchanted Kageyama, Yashiro knows it too, for he's an amazing judge of people. Watching Kageyama get interested in Kuga, Yashiro says that he wanted to see what Kageyama would look like falling in love with a man. What he really means is he wanted to know what Kageyama would look like falling in love with him. As the masochistic pervert we know him to be, Yashiro snoops on them getting it on with the help of a hidden camera. Yearn to be on your chin. But maybe he's not such a big fan of this type of pain, because he closes his laptop midway as if unable to watch anymore. Later, when confronted by Kageyama about the hidden cameras, Yashiro jokes about it and Kageyama acts outraged at his voyeurism. It's all fun and games and we laugh along until a tear comes out and we have to wonder why the hell this actually hurts to watch. But Yashiro himself reminds us why this hurts. Why couldn't it be me? And with just that line, it makes it impossible for us to laugh at his sexual deviancy anymore. Enter Domeki, whose first close-up encounter with Yashiro is seeing him deeply engaged in the pleasures of the flesh, to put it nicely. Fuck me, Jerry! And as great foreshadowing, we see Domeki trying to prevent Yashiro from being hurt further through violent sex. Oh. Harder, man! Harder! Oh, damn it! Right. And Yashiro, of course, clinging to his masochist label to dear life. Let's remember, we're only six minutes in. Even before Yashiro gets told by his subordinate Nanahara who Domeki is, he's trying and failing to close his office blinds for the fun he has already planned to have with his new bodyguard. We finally get a semi-formal introduction of Yashiro. <laughs><笑> As good an actor as Yashiro claims to be, we can't possibly miss his reaction to being told Domeki is impotent. As he tells Domeki that nothing good ever comes from acting out of character, I can't help but sigh. Worry not, he'll be acting out of character even more over the rest of this film and especially over the chapters of the manga. The first time we see Domeki prove his incredible perceptiveness is when he correctly infers that Yashiro was having sex with a detective when he walked in on them. 
This quiet and giant man assumed to be not too bright by Nanahara has been watching Yashiro from afar for a while. Yashiro is not used to being observed so closely, but there actually is one more person like Domiki around him. Enter Misumi, who's been watching Yashiro closely for even longer than Domiki has. It's refreshing to see Yashiro speak politely to someone for the first time so far, without his characteristic droll. Misumi immediately realizes Domiki thinks Yashiro is beautiful. He also immediately realizes Domiki is Yashiro's type. Tall, stoic, and stone-faced. I wonder if this is modeled by Yashiro's abusers or his only love, Kagema. But back to Misumi, he's a possessive man who's always been fond of Yashiro despite seeing him at arguably his worst. Misumi had a physical relationship with Yashiro in the past, but they're reportedly only drinking buddies now. Yet Misumi still tries to get Yashiro to work under him, in a position that is technically higher than his current one, but one which would also take away some of Yashiro's freedom. Yashiro hesitates to take that step, perhaps trying to keep as much freedom as he can possibly get. Giving Yashiro the Wakagashira position in Doshinkai would also be bypassing Yashiro's superior, Hirata, this utter dirtbag, which I won't discuss for now to avoid spilling more tears for our poor baby Yashiro, who asked for literally none of this. But anyway, anyway, Hirata suddenly shows up to Yashiro's company and insists on bringing Yashiro along to a Yakuza meeting. Of course, being the dirtbag that he is, he's just trying to flex on Yashiro and show he has power over him. This backfires, however, once Mizumi arrives at the meeting and chooses to sit beside Yashiro, although he is of higher rank. Suck that, Hirata! Both Hirata and the man around him glare towards Yashiro as this happens. Speaking of our Yakuza family, here's yet another member. At the end of the meeting, as Yashiro is leaving, Ryuzaki confronts him and tries to provoke him by attacking his promiscuity, as if that's anything new and as if Ryuzaki doesn't want his turn with him. Nanahara is upset that Yashiro might be losing face, the worst possible thing for a Yakuza, but we soon see why Yashiro is staying silent. He actually knows all about Yuzaki's dirty business and is not afraid to reveal it when the two are alone. Enough about the Yakuza plot though, let's go back to our favorite couple and their adventures together. In the meantime, we get introduced to a new character, Domiki's sister, who indirectly caused his impotence and who's incredibly upset that she might be the reason her brother joined the Yakuza. Yashiro is very drawn to everything about Domiki, so he's immediately intrigued about his sister. He goes as far as trying to get them on closer terms in his own way. Even more interestingly, Yashiro reveals to Aoi that he was a rape victim too, before he even tells Domiki. I suspect Yashiro is drawn to Domiki because of how pure he is and how much his sister's rape affected him. After all, nobody ever acted outraged at Yashiro's abuse. They only seemed outraged at his subsequent promiscuousness, a mere defense mechanism. I've always wondered whether Yashiro got so close to Aoi when he could have easily ignored her because he was envious of her. Looking at Aoi, we can imagine what Yashiro would have been like if only someone cared about him as much as Domeki cared about his sister. As Aoi confesses her love for Domeki, Yashiro remembers how he fell in love with Kageyama, the person he thought could save him but who ultimately chose to distance himself instead. In that moment, we have to wonder if Yashiro empathized with Aoi and thought, how could you not fall in love with a pure person like Domeki? And perhaps this thought strengthens when Domiki tells Yashiro he'll stay in contact with Aoi thanks to Yashiro's intervention. Domiki notices Yashiro's help and wants to stay by his side so he can protect him in return. But Yashiro doesn't trust Domiki's seemingly blind loyalty, because why would he? His prior experiences all center around being used or abused. As attractive as it might be for Yashiro to let Domiki fawn over him, he can't help but try to get Domiki to abandon him too. Here's my hot take that you may or may not agree with. Yashiro sees Domeki the same way he sees Kageyama right now, and expects him to distance himself as soon as he finds out the extent to which Yashiro's fucked up. In Yashiro's eyes, the only reason Domeki is so enamored is because he's seeing an idealized version of Yashiro in his head. But there's an issue here. When Domeki proves not to be like Kageyama and accepts Yashiro the way he truly is, Yashiro doesn't know what to do next. Exhibit A the backwashing scene, where Domiki compliments Yashiro's back and says it looks beautiful without a tattoo. Yashiro pushes back, saying, look harder, it's not beautiful. But Domiki insists that it is. Yashiro doesn't really have a comeback for that and instead turns things sexual, which is his usual coping mechanism. Exhibit B In the cosplay scene, when Domiki asks Yashiro why he wanted to see him in a policeman uniform, Yashiro answers, I don't know what rose-colored image you have of me painted in your mind, but I only think of sex. Domiki pushes back and asks Yashiro if that was also the case back at Kageyama's clinic, which clearly upsets Yashiro. 
He is so bothered to be observed so closely that he sleeps on the couch that night just to avoid being back to the bedroom where Domeki was. Exhibit C. In the same cosplay scene, Yashiro gets angry when Domeki says he's consenting to his ministrations. Why? Yashiro wants Domeki to be disgusted, or at least feel obligated to go along with his sexual wishes. Instead, Domeki says he's accepting and consenting to it. Once again, Yashiro's plan to drive Domeki away fails. And here's a few interesting tidbits that show Yashiro slowly falling for Domeki. For one, Yashiro suggests Domeki should go to the soap lands to see if that'll cure his impotence. Domeki says it's okay even if he remains impotent. This time, Domeki shows acceptance towards not being normal, something that Yashiro's not used to. Yashiro gets excited thinking about Domeki's first time being with the school nurse. He then thinks about it as Ryuzaki is doing him. Yashiro gets upset knowing Domeki is speaking casually around Kuga. He pretends to be upset, but is in fact dejected. Once again, an object of his affection is falling in the hands of someone else. And now, we arrive at my favorite and least favorite scene, yes, at the same time, in the whole movie. Domeki's discussion with Kageyama about Yashiro. Let's have a moment of silence before my blood starts to boil because I'm about to end this man's whole career. That was rain. At the bar where Kuga dragged them, Domiki questions Kageyama just like he did with Yashiro previously, trying to understand how the two think about each other. Kageyama starts by describing Yashiro as someone who stood out because he was weird, and notes how Domiki is not fearing or ridiculing Yashiro the way most other people do. That's interesting to hear from a man who also made fun of Yashiro's perverted habits from the very beginning of this movie. No, no he didn't, because Kageyama never bothered to stay in contact with Yashiro. As with his perversity, Kageyama simply disapproved of it from a comfortable distance. His excuse? When I met him, his household environment was already in the dumps, he didn't talk about it or rely on others, he didn't want to be pitied, and he's self-centered and can't see himself objectively, so he's actually quite pitiful. He can't empathize with other people, Kageyama says about the guy who showed up to his father's funeral utterly clueless about how to healthily support his only friend. He can't empathize, says the guy who can't put himself in Yashiro's shoes for long enough to see why he can't just be normal. If you really hate me being a Yakuza so much, I don't mind if you act like you don't know me, says this self-centered, unempathetic guy towards his only love interest that he's always wanted to be close to, knowing Kageyama wants to be as normal as possible. According to Kageyama, he goes easy on Yashiro because of his bad coping mechanisms. Isn't he a most generous god? I'm sure Yashiro, who's listening in on them, has many words of thanks for him. In Yashiro's flashbacks, we struggle to see this generosity Kageyama thinks he's shown. He asks Yashiro what his parents think of his lecherous behavior, asks him what he plans to do with his life, then tells him that he finds him pitiful for being alone and fucked up. Being looked down upon and pitied, the two things Yashiro loves the most. Ah. Hearing Kageyama say that he is alone, Yashiro is visibly shaken. In his mind, he was not alone because Kageyama was there too, sharing a dirty secret with him. But Kageyama wants to be normal and distance himself from the things he shares with Yashiro. That realization, well, hurts. After listening in on that conversation, Yashiro claims to understand himself and Kageyama more. Meanwhile, Domeki is just angry and conflicted and doesn't understand Kageyama one bit. How can one man be so unobservant? Here's the part where we need to remember just how observant Domeki is. He notices the detective, notices Yashiro's habits, and he notices Yashiro's feelings for Kageyama. As he follows Yashiro on the city streets, he thinks to himself, why does it bother me so much? Why does he not notice? Because to Domeki, who's been watching Yashiro so closely since he first laid eyes on him, it's impossible not to notice how he acts differently around Kageyama. To Domeki, who's been watching Yashiro so closely all this time, it's impossible not to notice how Kageyama's description of Yashiro seems so tone-deaf. In Kageyama's eyes, Yashiro remained a high school brat who does troublesome things and has a bad behavior. But rest assured, Kageyama forgives him. Just like in high school, Kageyama condemns Yashiro's behavior and separates himself from it. The irony. You might think by now that I hate Kageyama, but that's not the case actually. Kageyama is a great and believable character and he's not a bad guy. But it's hard to miss how he was and is the main barrier to Yashiro getting over his trauma. For Yashiro, a man who thinks he is undeserving of love to be rejected by his first, could have been healthy love, out of sheer ignorance on Kageyama's part is a huge blow. 
It was because of Kageyama that Yashiro gave up on love. And just like Domeki, I am irritated at Kageyama's blissful ignorance, but cannot hate him because he is not a bad man. This movie ends with Yashiro being shot in front of the pink cinema he went to with Domeki. And for us manga readers, this feels like a satisfying cliffhanger because we know what's coming next. A whole nother 60 minutes of content we can overanalyze and obsess over, of course. But in case you didn't read the manga, worry not, this is only the first part of a planned trilogy of films, with a prequel coming out in a few months' time. That prequel will be an adaptation of Don't Stay Gold, and will be shipped with the seventh volume of the manga in Japan on March 1st, 2021. I will very likely be reviewing Don't Stay Gold as well, because it's an amazing opportunity for me to deconstruct Kageyama's character some more, and give him a chance to redeem himself. That is, until Tadoya Doshizumazu, which documents their high school days, gets more screen time. Then I'm gonna destroy his career some more. Until then, I'ma reread the latest chapters obsessively as I always do. Thank you for joining me in my madness, and see you next time.